So my grandfather really wanted a son, but instead he had four daughters. So when I was born, I was the first male to enter the family. He was so happy that he bought me a white cow. <laughs> and those were my early memories as a child. Um, and being born in India, uh, we were you know, raised in an, a very large extended family. Uh, but by the age of four, uh, we moved to Chicago. And me and my family went through all of the uh, typical immigrant struggles, such as adopting to a new culture, uh, learning a new language, um, knowing what the societal norms were. So when I entered first grade on the very first day, my mom had no idea how to dress me um, because she was still wearing her traditional Indian saris. So she rem remembered that when she was in school in India that she would wear uh, a uniform. So she dressed me up in a powder blue suit <laughs> with a blue clip-on tie. <laughs> she walked me to school. And uh, my classmates were stunned. They thought she was an Indian queen and I was a little Indian prince. <laughs> but that uh, fascination quickly disappeared. But by the time I was in second grade, um, I was starting to get picked on, uh, being from a different culture. And one of the kids came up to me and called me a Hindu. And I didn't know what that meant. So I went home, asked my mom um, what that was, and she explained it to me. And inadvertently, this kid started me on a journey into religion. Ultimately, my parents uh, took me out of that school and put me into a Christian school um, because they thought maybe there would be more tolerance. What they didn't realize was that it was a Southern Baptist Christian school. <laughs> so you take a kid who's newly, um, uh, really curious about religion, put him into a radical Christian school that was on CNN a few decades later for its fundamental views, and you have the recipe for a perfect storm. The first day I entered uh, the Christian school in fourth grade, I loved it. I connected with people, I made friendships that I still have today. Um, I took the Bible home and read the whole Bible by the time I finished my fourth grade. And it wasn't a homework assignment, it was just pure, authentic sincerity. And I remember telling my parents um, that I wanted a bike, so they bought me a bike, and I found this bumper sticker which said, Honk if you love Jesus. So I put it on my bike, I rode it around the neighborhood, and my parents thought, oh my God, so cute. Our little, <laughs> our little Hindu boy loving Jesus. Um, but they didn't find it so cute when I started converting all the neighbors. So ultimately they took me out because they were scared that I was going to be a Christian pastor. Um, and once I left, I, you know, my journey continued. I, started, uh, I continued to study religion, and I explored every major world religion, including Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Islam, and I started seeing a pattern. Um, if you think about it, every major world religion has, some, has one theme in common, and that's the theme of salvation. It's about escaping, suffering, um, escaping death, getting immortality. And religion is really just one of these systems, because if you think about it, we have society, culture, your uh, profession. If you follow the rules, um, you know, you listen to the dogma, you climb the ladder, uh, you get rewarded, you'll be remembered beyond your life. But really what these systems are trying to do is that they're trying to um, give you some meaning. And why is meaning so important? Because we as humans are very unique. Um, we have this propensity to survive, but at the same time, we have this really highly developed brain that understands we're going to die, even if it's not immediately. So that puts us in a very precarious situation. So we use these systems to get us some structure, give us some certainty. But if you think about it, all of the greatest religious masters, the people who have really changed our world, used the systems to a certain extent, but then they broke the rules. They followed their own intuition, heart, they found their own meaning. So how do you find your own meaning? Well, there's three ways. First, you need a purpose. You need to know why you get up in the morning. And, you, and it has to be one of a compelling future with hope. Second, you need morals and values. 
And the reason is, is because we are wired for empathy, which I'll explain later. And third is significance. We need to feel that the people around us have some esteem for us, that we're bringing some value into this world. And if you think about it, all three of those things have to do w either with our higher self or with other people. So it's about connection. And why is co connection so important? It's because we need to feel the one emotion that really uh, drives all of us, and that's love. So if meaning is what drives us, connection is the vehicle, then love is the fuel. Viktor Frankl once said, love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. The salvation of man is through love and in love. Now, Viktor Frankl was a man who was shipped off to the concentration camps. He lost his wife, his mother, father, brother, and countless other friends. But somehow he experienced love. He saw people who had one, one piece of bread, that's all they had for the day, give it up to somebody else who was more hungry. So we are not wired just for our own self-interest. There's more to us than that. If you look at the human brain, very fascinating structure. 100 trillion cells in three pounds of tofu-like material between, between our ears. And in the middle, the area that's lighting up, that's the limbic system that controls our emotions. The little dot right there is the amygdala, size of an almond, but probably the most powerful structure in our brain because this is what controls our memory with emotion. So if someone were to surgically remove your amygdala, you would still remember things. You would remember the context, you would remember your mother, but you wouldn't have any emotion with it. So the meaning is lost. So there's a reason we have the amygdala, because we need meaning. This is probably the most fascinating finding, the concept of mirror neurons. Italian scientists were doing studies on monkeys with functional MRIs. And what they noticed was, was that when a monkey picked up a banana, there was an area in the brain that lit up. But what was really interesting was that when someone else picked up the same banana, the same area lit up. So this area that was lighting up, these neurons, were called mirror neurons. Scientists now believe that these neurons are responsible for imitation as well as empathy, because a monkey could feel someone else picking up that banana. What's even more interesting is, is that these neurons are projecting outward all the time, assessing what you're doing, what you're feeling, what your intentions are. So we literally are connected all the time. Our brains have evolved into social organisms, and social organs specifically. So if we are such social, connected beings, why are we so alone? Read the statistic. 25% of Americans have no authentic or intimate connections to confide with. This was a study done in 2004. That means one in four of us don't have a real friend that we can talk, talk to. And why is that? There's a lot of theories, but of course, technology has been the leading culprit. Technology has allowed us to um, make more connections. We can email, we can text social media, but the quality of those connections have gone down. It's because we can wear a mask. We don't have to show people our bad side. We can just show them our good side. We don't have to be vulnerable anymore. And without that vulnerability, we can't have authentic connections. So I recently have gone through my own personal loss and probably the most painful experience in my life. But fortunately, I had the tools to find my own meaning. And I had great friends, family, connections who were able to, to bring me out of it. But I, I realized for maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I understood a, an ounce of what a cancer patient feels when, when they go through a diagnosis, lose their sense of meaning. So I started a nonprofit which helps c cancer patients find their own meaning, a new meaning, after they get diagnosed. And then we connect them through 
local uh, businesses in the community so that they can thrive. And what we've seen as these patients go through our program has been truly inspiring. There's one patient, his name is Dale, he's in his early 40s. And he was uh, recently diagnosed with a thymoma, which is a tumor in the middle of your chest. So uh, Dale, when he was at the age of 19, lost his father. And he lost a sense of meaning at that time. So he dove into his work uh, because work kind of numbed his pain. He ended up getting married, he had children, but never really connected. So when he got diagnosed in his 40s, he thought he needed to change his life. So he came to us, he went through our program. We helped him find a new meaning, which was to be strong for his family, uh, to really be present uh, with his kids. So recently he told us that he was going on a walk with his teenage daughter. And she looked at him and she said, uh, you know, Dad, you're an inspiration. And that was the meaning that he needed. That made all the difference. So maybe, you know, the question isn't what is the meaning of life? Because I think life is asking you all the time, what is your meaning? Why are you here? What are you doing with your time? If I asked you or told you you had one year left to live, what would you do? You may get answers like, you know, I'm going to travel the world. I want to buy that car I never bought. What if you had one day? Your answers would change, probably. I know what I would be doing if I had one day. I'd be spending it with my daughter, with my family, the people I love. So if there's one thing you're going to get out of my talk, get this. Embrace your mortality. Embrace life's challenges. Viktor Frankl said, it's how you boldly face life's challenges that brings you meaning. Connect. Don't just connect on email or text. Really connect. Bring down that mask. Be vulnerable. Because without those authentic connections, you're never going to feel that give and take um, of a connection, which without, you're never going to experience love. And really, that's what it's about. And thank God this isn't karaoke, but the Beatles got it right. <laughs> because all you need is love, and love is all you need. Thank you very much.